to be introducing Siddharth Chaudhary's book. Um, I had a tough time deciding which one to nominate because I think I also really, really, really enjoyed Patna Rafkat, which I read earlier. But then I um, picked Day Scholar, which at some level is kind of more about me than about the books because Day Scholar is a Delhi book and uh, I know a little bit more about Delhi and Delhi University where I also studied, though I think I probably inhabited quite a different milieu from the one that's in uh, Siddharth's book. Uh, but I thought that I would pick the Delhi book over the Patna book just, you know. But you're all very lucky because you're going to have a Patna Rafkat discussion tomorrow as well. Uh, am I clear? Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is a bit of a cop-out because I am going to sort of read a long review that I had once done of uh, Siddharth Chaudhary's Day Scholar. And I'm going to add longer quotes where I feel it necessary. And, uh, well, let me just say I'm a fan of the book. That's why I picked it. So let me just... Okay. Um, on the face of it, Siddharth Chaudhary's Day Scholar is a coming-of-age novel. Um, the book's own inside cover, as the introducer just said, actually describes it as a crazed and profane coming-of-age tale whose plot is ostensibly about how Patna boy Hriday Thakur, who, quote, hopes to become a writer someday, is first, quote, trapped by a series of misjudgments and later, quote, saved from a terrible end. But much like Chaudhary's previous offering, Patna Rafkat, which was also billed as a story of love, idealism, and sexual awakening that takes us to the heart of an aching, throbbing youth. These are not Chaudhary's words, but his um, blurbs. Uh, Day Scholar is also, despite a self-referential moment when its protagonist is asked by its father, by his father about how his building's roman is coming along, is not a really a book that seems containable within the neat boundaries of the coming-of-age genre. This is not necessarily a criticism. While there are those who might be baffled by the freewheeling air with which Chaudhary moves in and out of the lives of several different characters, or even feel cheated out of the readerly pleasure afforded by deep identification with a single protagonist, Chaudhary has an admirable ability to weave what may seem like disparate anecdotes about several kinds of Khans into a seamless narrative. Kand, for those, I mean, I don't think there are any of you here, but just in case, for those not party to the often sublime pleasures of Hindi, Kand can translate into something as neutral as event or acquire as vast a sense as catastrophe. Uh, Chaudhary is a master of the shaggy dog story, often going off on long-winded tangents that seem entirely unpremeditated until you realize that he, had ma he has managed to entirely shift the emotional register of his narrative within the space of a paragraph or even a sentence. So a quietly cynical account of, him, of being a small-time reporter, I am not one of those hotshot political analysts who ferret out important things about life and corruption. I write about minor cultural happenings, and if Patna had a vibrant cocktail circuit, I would be what you call a society reporter, can segue without warning into the chillingly banal details of a, quote, human interest story about a, quote, carpenter by caste being found dead inside Golghar alongside a suicide note saying that his Bhumihar wife of two months had been abducted by her parents. Or a bunch of regulars at the rundown Annapurna Cafe, this is in uh, 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 Patna Rafkat, can move from sniggering about the death of someone they know as, being, as his being set for life to being forced to reluctantly register the event as a tragedy. Quote, the laughter slowly left their lips. They lowered their eyes and dragged on a charminar. Close, close. Closed. The constant movement between cynicism and sentiment seems, in fact, to be a characteristic of Chaudhary's narratorial voice. In Patna Rafkat, his first novel, published in 2005, this voice was even more unpolished, literally Rafkat. That book opened, for instance, with the following analogy. Quote, dreams are like cut glass carafes. They only look beautiful on the sideboards of the rich, because if a particular dream suddenly shatters, they can always buy another. The poor shouldn't dream. They can't afford it. Close quote. There is something about this, combining as it does the dramatic tone of 1980s filmy dialogue with the attempted epigraph-like tone of teenage autograph books that comes off sounding much less cool and much more sentimental than it seems to aim for. At first reading, it appears naive, cliched, wannabe philosophical all at once. But then it strikes one that that may be precisely the tone that the author intends to create, the voice of a narrator who is much less cynical than he pretends to be, whose self-conscious veneer of bravado is often betrayed by a rather emotional, even romantic core. 
This tone is common to both Rithvik Ray of Patna Rafkat and Hrida Thakur of Day Scholar, whose first-person narratives make up a great part of those books, respectively. Um, there are several other things that Rithvik and Hrida have in common. Their Patna pasts, their Delhi University present, and their writerly ambitions. They share these with each other, as well as with Siddharth Chaudhary, which might push readers in the direction of reading these novels as autobiographical, which they may well be, and we'll find out hopefully in the question and answer session. If, uh, but Chaudhary preempts any such boringly linear thoughts with some clever intertextual jugglery, making, making Ritwik, his girlfriend Meera Verma, and the subaltern historian Samar Sinha from Patna Rafkat make guest appearances in Day Scholar. Even minor characters reappear, like Sudama Pathak, who appears in Patna Rafkat as the author of the masterful and deeply unsettling Patna Good Food Guide, and reappears in Day Scholar when he befriends Ride, his junior at Commerce College, and then plays a critical role in his arrival at Shokin Nivas, the four hostel full of largely Bihari Delhi University students that is the setting for Day Scholar. This constant cross-referencing of characters between books and within them, creates a kind of deliberate jigsaw of characters and events, and goes a long way towards making Chaudhary's universe come brilliantly and cinematically to life, in the manner of some Robert Altman movie. The other thing that Chaudhary has, and has in abundance, is a sense of place, which is linked, of course, to a sense of time. If in Patna Rafkat he cuts rapidly between Patna's past and present, in Day Scholar, he concentrates on recreating an early 1990s world. It is the world of pre-liberalization India, constituted in no small measure through the invocation of a constellation of often branded objects whose names are enough to jolt the reader, the Indian reader of a certain age into a shared nostalgia for a middle-class material culture that seems historic, even if its constituents may in fact survive even today. Sandu Ganges, Rajdoot 175 motorcycles, brilliant tutorials, portable Panasonics, flared black jeans, quote, the kind one bought cheap from Tank Road in Karolbagh, Graviera suit lengths offered as Guru Dakshina to those who wrote exams on one's behalf. In terms of locale, with day scholars, Chaudhary's center of gravity moves from Patna's Kadam Kadam Kuma, a place of genteel shabbiness, where ambition and upward mobility are looked down upon and the trading class is frankly distrusted to the badlands of North Delhi, encompassing Delhi University with Shaukeen Nivas at its center. The pride taken in the acquisition of Shaukeen Nivas by its half jat half Gujar owner, the formidable light-eyed political broker and property dealer, Zorawar Singh Shaukeen, gives Chaudhary a chance to mull lovingly on the spatio-historical landscape of North Campus and its hinterlands. Quote, from the terrace, Zorawar can see Kirodimal and Hansraj College at a th stone's throw. Beyond loom the, loom the dense keeker instructed, sorry, sorry. Beyond loom the dense keeker encrusted Delhi Ridge and Bada, Bada Hindu Rao, where in 1857 Zorawar's Gujar ancestors fought their last stand against the British and their Sikh mercenaries and forever lost the land on which the North Campus would later be built. Hindu College, St. Stephen's College, and the back gate of Miranda House. If Zurawar turns his head, he can see Rupnagar, Shakti Nagar, Amba Cinema Hall, and outside it, Darvesh Dhaba, which serves wonderful frontier food, and finally, Malka Ganj, where Mrs. Midha, his future paramour, lives with her homeopath husband and 14-year-old daughter, etc. The quote carries on. Later in the book, Chaudhary pithily describes the campus coming alive with the public theater of male-female interaction. Quote, like in most small towns of Bihar, when evening descends and people saunter off to the nearby railway station for entertainment, so in Delhi University, Biharis lit out for Chhatramark. They would, there they would dawdle for a couple of hours, have tea at Jai Jawan Dhaba, meet their girlfriends and thrash out compromises without any group coming to real blows. Compromises were usually about imagined slights to one's dignity concerning a girl who was a court sister, even though the girl may not have known the guy, but was from the same town. As should, close, quote closed. As should be apparent from all this, Chaudhary has few equals when it comes to the deftly drawn pen portrait. His prose may appear littered with names and places and dates and events, mostly remembered ones, though sometimes also, as in the passage above, events still to come. But if you look carefully, this dense accumulation of detail is carried out with the utmost attentiveness. The throwaway ease with which new characters are introduced and side stories told is a narratorial strategy, deliberately crafted to create the impression of chatty, gossipy storytelling, what in North India might most clearly be described as gup. And one of the most striking things about this gupbaz tone is its uncensored, unexpurgated quality. 
Among the things Chaudhary is not coy about is sex. Day Scholar opens with a sex, sex scene that involves not just its mutually consenting participants, but also a whole contingent of peeping toms. Later, it introduces the reader to such remarkable psychosocial concepts um, of the Delhi University world, or perhaps beyond it, as the Chutpal. Just as every door has a Dwarpal, every truth has a Chutpal. A Chutpal never gets the truth, just like the Dwarpal rarely gets to sleep in the master bedroom. Every good girl needs at least one Chutpal to run errands for her and listen to her bitch about her mother. This is put in the, in the mouth of a character called Jishnu, who we'll hear more about. Um, even more striking though, are Chaudhary's, or rather his character's, unabashed references to caste, around which most Indian writing in English tends to maintain a cordon sanitaire of coyness and or stifling political correctness, even stronger than that which surrounds sex and sexuality. Chaudhary has no such compunctions. From <clears throat> there is, for example, his lucid definition of the Patna practice of Pervi. Quote, in a Pervi, one didn't pay a bribe. It was about whom you knew and how good your own caste network was and whether your caste was in ascendance or in decline. Close quote. And then from, Bhum from this Bhumihar Jishnudas distrust of Bengalis, quote, they think too much. You cannot trust such people, close quote. Through the matter of fact reference to the delicacy of Banya girls, quote, before the fat finally catches up with them, or Mrs. Midha's comment about liberalization as God's gift to the upper castes. This is a world in which caste is simply a fact of life, the basis of opinions, alliances, and battles, not something swept under the carpet. Like with much else in Day Scholar, it may seem unsavory, but it seems always real. Thank you. Next is the theatrical enactment of the book. For this, we invite Mr. Karthike Ambardar. He has been performing in the Delhi theater circuit for close to a decade now. Although a PR executive by profession, he has in the past worked as an anchor for NDTV and acted with many directors. He's currently working on a musical theater production and a self-scripted short film. Family owned quite a bit of land near Nadol in Jainabad district. Where the joke in some enlightened circles in Patna was that whenever on some winter night it got unbearably chilly, the upper castes gathered together and went to the nearest untouchable and landless labour settlement and set it alight. The upper caste could then warm their hands on the spreading heat. But with the recent spread of CPIML activism in the district, much of the joy of living simple everyday pleasures like rape, beatings and bonfires had suddenly been denied to the upper castes, especially the Bhumihar majority and the Rajputs. Now even for their weddings, the upper castes crept out of their houses like fugitives so that CPIML carders wouldn't run, uh, get into their houses and attack them while they were away. The days of 500 Bharatis, three-day revelries, the dances of notch girls from Calcutta and Banaras, indiscriminate firing in the air of double barrel shotguns and Lee Enfield rifles were over. Upper caste weddings in villages in the 1990s were a clandestine affair. Barely 30, 40 people from each side took part in the festivities. Though only five feet six inches tall in his thick-soled Chinese flip-flops from the Tibetan monastery market near ISBT, I had once seen Jishnu Da slash a six feet tall jat boy's face with an astura outside the Miranda House hostel gate on Chhatramal. Most fights, compromises and shows of strength those days took place outside the Miranda hostel. Between four, when the girls came out slouching in their ungrazy, crumpled, unwashed jeans and equally woebegone t-shirts after their afternoon catnap, each carrying a huge mug of lukewarm tea. And 7.30, when they finally retired for the night. The ice cream wala and the bhel puri wala would leave soon after. Chhatra Marg was the preferred open air auditorium for all sorts of tamasha and nukkar natas. Some elaborately mounted and performed, but most hastily improvised. The discerning audience, largely female, quite appreciative of the talent on display. It has been my good fortune to discover that nothing quite captures the female imagination as male conflict. An astura thinly coated with dried blood will always get more attention than a white rose wrapped in cellophane. Like in most small towns of Bihar, when evening descends and people saunter off to the nearby railway junction for entertainment, so in Delhi universities, Biharis came out of their boroughs in Kamla Nagar, Vijay Nagar, Indra Vihar, Morris Nagar, Mukherjee Nagar, Hakikat Nagar, and myriad other Nagars and Vihars, and set off for Chhatramal. There, they would dawdle for a couple of hours, 
have Tia Jai Jawan Dhaba, meet their girlfriends at Miranda or PG Women's or Make Dooth Hostels, and thrash out compromises without any group coming to real blows. Now, compromises were usually about imagined slights to one's dignity concerning a girl who was a sister, even though the girl may not have known the guy but was from the same town. Or it was some remark in some drunken party which had filtered back to the person concerned a month later with much mirch masala added. Or better still, during July, August, with election fever in the air, which candidates to support, whom not to support, and which lucky bugger would have to be forced to withdraw his candidature. When two groups were close to a major fight, the side which got hit or threatened first would look for a suitable compromiser. A kind of amicus curiae, who Sudama Patak of Kadam Kuan. Or from Delhi, if one cites Mahinder Foji of Najafgarh, I let slip Uncle Zuravar Singh Shokin of Chandrawal's name. You see, it's all about naming names. One instinctively knows who's telling the truth and who's just showing off. Usually two minutes of this, and then Visarjan, shake and grow. A couple of days previous to the incident involving the Jard boy, a friend of Jishnu Da's came from Kadamkua. Paritosh Bhattacharya had written him a letter. Jishnu Da had ambled over to our room, bearing the registered letter aloft like a flag, wearing new mini mouse Bermudas with his trademark Sando Ganji. On the portable Panasonic, Springsteen's mellow and brooding Nebraska was playing. Pranjal had bought the CBS tape on his way back from Hindu in the afternoon. Since then, we had played it back to back a couple of times especially highway patrolmen and used cars. Chishnu Da switched the stereo off. He didn't much care for rock music or the boss. His favorite song was that legendary torch song from Bhakt about sexual inadequacy. Aage bhi jane na tu, piche bhi jane na tu. So, on Friday nights, invariably after the second peg, he would demand the song be played and a special cassette called the Khamba Collection that a girl from Kadam Kuan had made for him would be fetched from his room by Ramanuj Ghosh. The cassette featured the entire soundtrack of Arth, Saat Saat, Ghar and Bazaar among many of other love songs from Hindi movies. I closed a house for Mr. Biswas and looked expectantly while Pranjal put aside his macroeconomics textbook with a world weary sigh. Chishtu Da sprawled on Pranjal's cot, put on his round wire frame Mahatma Gandhi glasses, and read out the letter to us. The ever-present ganja spike navy cut smoldering between his left forefinger and thumb, and his left ball peeking out of his bermuda.